Hi, everybody. Um, this is Josh Tolkien. I'm your co-host for the Electing Environmental Champions in Maryland webinar this evening. Um, I'm going to be working the tech and talking about a little bit of the organizing. And uh, the other co-host is Betsy Johnson, our political chair. As a hello and audio test, Betsy, can you say hi? Hi there. We know that elections define the conversations that happen in society. They define the priorities, the issues that somebody runs on, or the issues they feel accountable for for a long time to come, uh, and that the elections help elevate Sierra Club's role in the public process. Um, the more our name is prominent in having helped shape the election, the more uh, cachet we have in helping to discuss it. Um, that's one of the reasons that Sierra Club is incorporated as a 501c4 organization. And if you're not savvy on tax status, that's okay. But what that means is that we retain the right to engage in elections work. Um, we do endorsements, we campaign, and unlike other nonpartisan, nonprofit organizations that have to stay as far from elections as possible, Sierra Club set up to engage in them precisely because of how incredibly important we believe they are. Um, so in this presentation, we're gonna be going back and forth between talking about some general election strategies um, and uh, as well as specific components of Sierra Club's election strategy and election process. And so I think at this point, I'm gonna be turning it over to Betsy Johnson to talk a little bit about um, elections, why they're so important. Oh, Betsy, I'm going to jump ahead on my one quote here. Um, a very wise man once said, a good election strategy isn't just concerned with who gets elected, but who gets them elected. If you want a candidate to promote your issues, you need to promote them. That was uh, stated by, uh, oh, Josh Tolkien, uh, May 23rd, 2017, about four hours ago. Um, <laughs> Thank you for laughing, Betsy, because I just realized everyone else is on mute, so I'm just going to assume everybody thinks that is funny. Yeah. Um, but essentially, I, I wanted to, to come in with a, talking about the importance, not just of who gets elected, but also talking about the strategic benefit of being involved as an organized group, which is part of what we're going to implore you all to join us in tonight. Um, so, Betsy, can I turn it over to you to start with... Uh, 2018 election and moving forward? Yes, so um, we have, uh, this is our big election. Every four years in Maryland, we have everybody who has been elected is, well, not, this is not everybody, but, but almost everybody who has been elected in the state of Maryland is up for re-election. And in 2018, we have a lot of stuff going on. We have all the congressional seats, um, which are always up for uh, election every two years, lucky them. Um, <laughs> uh, we may have some exciting stuff going on in District 1 because uh, Andy Harris is our Tea Party representative and I suspect that he's going to get some real pushback from Democrats in District 1, which is mostly Eastern Shore and some of the area north of Baltimore. Um, Jamie Raskin is a, uh, one of our heroes that we got elected last year. And I suspect, although I don't know for sure yet, that he will be challenged because he was elected with uh, less than 50% of the vote because the, um, the other candidates split the vote. Um, so we want to defend Jamie and uh, make sure he gets reelected. Um, Senator Cardin has not indicated whether he will run for reelection and he, sure would be up for election in 2018. If he does not run, then we have one of these big um, musical chair things going on where uh, you know we're gonna have people coming out of the woodwork to run for US Senate. So that's another, another possibility. Uh, Governor Hogan is up for reelection. He's already raising money and he's already, um, 
putting out uh, statements that sound like re-election stuff to me. Um, so, uh, and there are a lot of Democrats that are lining up to oppose him. Um, we, we usually don't endorse on the controller's race, but um, we did endorse uh, um, Brian Frosch for attorney general last, uh, last in 2014. And uh, he squeaked by and he's been doing a great job for us. And so we definitely want to support him. Um, and then we have a lot of local county and city races where uh, we will be making endorsements and um, going to let um, Josh talk about our state races because all of our state uh, delegates and senators are up for election as well. And he is one of our chief lobbyists and uh, he really knows the legislature very well. So Josh, uh, why don't you talk about that? Thanks, Betsy. Um, th the first thing I'll note, many of you know that the most hotly contested races at the state level in Maryland are usually in the primary. Um, yes. Now, some people may just say, look, if it's a Democrat, I'll just vote for the Democrat in the general. Um, but what we find is just even with a Democratic supermajority in the state, in, in the House of Delegates in the state Senate, it doesn't guarantee a victory. Um, and uh, the bigger the party, the, uh, the, 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 the bigger the tent, basically, the wider the, the views you have. So we have um, several races that are going to be critical, not just for ensuring that we have a majority of environmentalists, but ensuring that the folks who get elected feel that the environmentalists are their constituency. So I'm just going to name a couple. First, uh, right after... Um, if, you, if you all recall, Governor Hogan ran in large part talking about the so-called rain tax. We called it our polluted runoff fee or the stormwater utility fee. Um, there has been some significant um, attack ads being run at several environmentalists who voted in support of both the, um, the stormwater uh, utility fee as well as uh, recent bills this last legislative session to increase clean energy uh, and solar, which he is calling the, um, the sun tax um, and uh, Change Maryland, which was the, his backing organization has run attack ads against five state senators and Governor Hogan has publicly come out saying he's targeting these five seats to try to knock out the, um, the Democrats supermajority. Now, to be clear, this is not a partisan statement, but I will note that the supermajority of the Democrats is what enabled um, the Democrats to override the governor's veto of the Clean Energy Jobs Act this last year, as well as several really important transportation bills. Um, so while we're not looking for a Democratic supermajority, we are looking to ensure a supermajority of pro-environment candidates. Um, top on his hit list is Senator Ron Young from Frederick, um, who also sits on the Education, Health, and Environmental Affairs Committee. Um, secondly, Senator John Astle from Annapolis is going to be running for mayor of Annapolis, which will vacate a Senate seat um, that, uh, in which two of the three delegates in that area are um, fairly conservative. So it's actually probably going to be a hotly contested seat. Um, in addition, there's a very interesting race in uh, Baltimore County where Senator Kathy Klausmeyer, who's been a decent but not great vote for the environment, might get challenged by a very pro-environment Republican, um, Delegate Christian Mealy, which will be a really interesting race. Um, and then there uh, are, are several other seats that we think will likely be contested. Additionally, um, we expect that uh, the Montgomery County and several other counties um, vacancies, in some cases because of term limits, are going to lead several delegates and senators to run for county councils and other offices, um, which creates a great opportunity for us to have a really significant impact in getting the right people elected. So in many cases, it's not like this is going to go from Democrat to Republican, but it does mean that we have a chance to get 
exactly the champions that we need into these seats. Um, so we're gonna be tracking these and sharing this information and trying to figure out which are the um, most hotly contested races and also where do we want to be participating in a way that Sierra Club's presence um, will help ensure that these people remember that they were elected by environmentalists and have some, uh, um, some loyalty to that constituency once in office. And uh, Betsy, I can, with that, I can hand it back to you. Okay, so um, there is a lot of work to be done and I'm not going to go into all the nitty gritty on, on what it is that we do. I'm just going to give you the high points. Um, so our endorsement process, which is something that everybody is very interested in, <laughs> um, is this. We partner with Maryland LCB and and the Clean Water Action, who are the other two um, organizations in the state that make endorsements. And we, we all three organizations come together to do um, candidate questionnaires for the state level races. We also um, uh, create questionnaires for the uh, local and city races. And uh, Sierra Club is, is front and center on that because the other two organizations don't don't um, typically, I shouldn't say that they never do, but they don't typically um, operate at the local level. Um, we do partner on interviews with candidates. Uh, we have to schedule those interviews and that's a big um, uh, difficult thing to do because we're scheduling them for three different organizations. So, um, then uh, once we have the candidates interviewed, um, we have internal discussions. Uh, Sierra Club makes its own endorsements as, as do the other two organizations. So we only partner on the questionnaire and the interviews. Um, so we discuss and we make recommendations about who we think um, should be endorsed. Um, in the Sierra Club, the uh, recommendations have to be approved by two levels of the club. Um, often the, uh, at least two levels of the club, which I'll come back to. And then uh, we make the announcement. And then of course we, we try to support people who we have endorsed. Um, next slide. Whoops, wait a second. I'm... <laughs> Um, so, um, a lot of people don't realize that, that the Sierra Club is all one big club. We have the National Sierra Club is made up of chapters, of which Maryland is one, and the chapters are made up of groups, and Maryland has eight groups. Um, so, we have uh, delegated responsibilities to these particular entities. So the group political committees, they are responsible for doing county city level um, um, questionnaires, interviews, recommendations, et cetera. So that would be you know, Montgomery County, Prince George's County, Anne Arundel, Baltimore, et cetera. Um, they also weigh in on the state endorsements. So, um, there's some crossover there. The Maryland Chapter Political Committee, which is the committee for the state of Maryland and incorporates all of the group political chairs. Um, we are responsible for, um, in many cases, uh, doing the state endorsements and also recommends recommendations for the federal endorsements. And the two levels of the club for, for, that have to approve federal endorsements are the chapter executive committee and the national political committee. So we, we are not responsible for the final approval of any federal endorsement. We have to, we have to um, 
send a recommendation to the National Political Committee, and they sometimes, very rarely, um, say no. <laughs> so most of the time they say yes, though. Okay, next slide. So basically, um, our endorsement strategy is this. We, we first of all look at incumbents. And if there are incumbents who have helped us achieve our goals, our, our legislative goals, um, that's a very important thing because incumbents are very, very cross with us if we, <laughs> if we um, ask them to do things and they do them and then we go and endorse their opponents. They don't like that. So if they've been very helpful to us and they've helped us achieve our goals, particularly if, they've, if they have uh, sponsored legislation and um, work to get, you know, really done the work to get it passed, I mean, we endorse them. So we have to decide which incumbents we're going to endorse. Betsy? Yeah. Would it be okay if I jumped in on that for a second? Sure. Um, this is Josh. I was going to say, because um, for organizations that don't do any legislative work, it's easy to always think that the grass is greener uh, looking for a challenger. In the Sierra Club world, I think we challenge ourselves to be asking elected officials for what we truly need. So if somebody has a 100% record voting for everything we ask them for and we're still dissatisfied, we see that as, as a shortcoming on our part, that we've clearly not been asking enough if this person has done everything we've asked and somehow we're, we're saying they haven't done enough. So part of the challenge of looking for the incumbents is that we need to make sure that we're ambitious enough that um, the true environmentalists are sticking with us and the people who can't uh, live up to that, you know, actually have to say no. If someone can vote consistently with us and we're still not happy with them, that probably means we're, we are not doing a good enough job setting the bar high um, in our legislative um, objectives. So what I see what, in a legislature, um, people who maybe aren't thinking 24 seven about the environment, their big question is, what do you want me to do? Um, and it's our job to make sure that we're asking them for everything that we need so that we can figure out who is with us or who is not living up to it. Right, and, and it, it invariably happens during an election season that an incumbent is challenged by somebody who sounds much better than the incumbent on our issue. <laughs> and when we endorse the incumbent, we often get a lot of pushback. But that's the reason is that we, we really want to make sure that we back the people who have helped us. Because the voting record know, is the best, the the voting record carries more weight than a, than, yes. than a platform. A challenger can say anything, but an incumbent has to do stuff. And we, we, we want to see people do stuff. So, so, that's, uh, so that's the incumbency rule that we're, we're, um, that we're acting on. Um, so for open seats, um, we, we interview candidates. Um, and for seats where we haven't made an early endorsement of an incumbent, we interview candidates, and uh, what we look for are people who are not only with, with, us, with us on the issues, but who also have a cogent election strategy, who have um, raised money, who have developed an election plan, a campaign plan, and are executing it. And we have a feeling that they could win. Um, we don't want to endorse a purist who is great on our issues, but may, you know, just ha doesn't have it together in terms of uh, political strategy. So, um, and I would like to say that we're also looking 
Um, we are a bar bipartisan organization, and in the past we have endorsed many uh, very good Republicans, um, and we're always looking for Republicans who uh, will be supportive of us, of us on our issues. And um, in, there are a lot of uh, conservative areas of Maryland where um, we may find Republicans who we want to endorse. So, um, so that's basically our endorsement strategy. And I will turn it over to Josh to talk about our timeline. Excellent. Um, so this is a preliminary timeline. We are sitting down with the League of Conservation Voters and Clean Water Action to confirm this. Um, but when I did the draft, it astounded me at how quickly this was approaching. So we wanted to share this timeline with you. Um, in the next two months, we're going to be working on our questionnaires. Um, and just so you know, the way that works internally at Sierra Club is that we will um, share either draft questions or request draft questions from our different issue teams. So most of the issue teams will get a chance to weigh in on the questions that we ask to the candidates. Um, in July, we'll roll out the questionnaires. And the way we do that is by basically creating a list of everyone who has officially um, uh, signed up as a candidate, as well as everybody that we know about informally. We'll get the questionnaire to anybody who has demonstrated a modicum of interest that we can find on the web or social media, et cetera. And that's one of the needs we always have is tracking those folks. Um, September and October are uh, interviews. So it takes you know two months or so to get the questionnaires back. Um, and during that, this time period, we'll be coordinating interviews with LCV and Clean Water Action at the local level. A lot of the interviews do happen back in the district. Um, after the interviews happen, that first level that Betsy was talking about deliberates on endorsements. Um, sometimes one person has made it to all the interviews, sometimes different people have. So we really have to compare all the information and we try to be really, um, uh, we like, to, uh, we shoot for a very high level of integrity in our system, challenging our own biases. Um, so that recommendation will happen through two levels of the club. Um, now, this is interesting. The, uh, um, the legislative session, as you all know, runs from mid-January to from early January to early April. At this point, we're uh, thinking about doing our endorsements likely either in November, December, and early January, or in April after the legislative session ends. We don't anticipate doing a lot of endorsements during the legislative session. So we'll probably do the early endorsements uh, around November, if not earlier. We might hold off on a couple of endorsements to see how folks perform, at least incumbents perform in the legislative session. Um, now the session ends around April 9th, I think, and the primary is June 26th. So that leaves a little, just about two and a half months for what's probably going to be the heaviest campaigning. And that's the point at which we'll actually be working and that sort of phase two of this presentation is what we do in the electioneering portion working in support of the candidates that we've endorsed um, in the vast majority of cases uh, we then endorse again um, the person who we endorsed in the primary if they've won the primary or we will make an endorsement in the election um, in the general on our second or third pick um, in the very rare occasion where we endorse a Democrat and a Republican in the primary and they both win, um, we ultimately do have to make a decision which of those we have to, we want to endorse. Uh, Josh? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> we, we don't endorse uh, in each primary. In the Republican. That would explain, I was about to say that that's never happened since I've been here and that would explain yeah. why. Okay. Well, because it creates a lot of confusion if they both win. Got it. Oh. That makes sense. Yep. Okay. So moving along, uh, Betsy, do you want to pick up again on the uh, volunteer yeah. opportunities in the endorsement phase? Yep. So, um, so we need people um, to, uh, to do some jobs uh, that, that we've talked about so far. 
So one is to create a list of candidates. And I'm looking uh, to, to get um, teams of people who um, can take on a particular district, either at the local level or the state level. And I mean, it would be nice if we got um, an, a, a team to cover every district in the state. I doubt that that's gonna be the case. But anyway, we, it, it, looking for candidates is, um, is, a, is a big job because uh, the filing date is in February and a lot of candidates wait until the last minute to file, which is very, you know, makes it difficult. So we, we need for people to, you know, kind of scan the blogs and the news, newspapers and um, online stuff to, to um, find candidates. We need people to research candidate records. So for people who have held elective office, that is a fairly straightforward thing. But for people who haven't held, uh, candidates who haven't held elective office, um, we need to look and see what, what they've done in their um, careers or uh, volunteer work that uh, would indicate that they would be supportive of us. Um, we need volunteers to help develop local and state questionnaires, although um, usually that, that falls to the executive committees or the political committees of the uh, local and state. Um, so, um, Okay, so, so then um, how, we need people to help schedule and prepare for interviews, uh, get the venues, um, and uh, you know, work with the other organizations to make sure that we have the interviews covered. Um, and, and we need people to actually join and interview, join interview teams. And I, I like to have the same people interview every candidate from a particular district so that we have, so that we can compare notes at the end. Um, and we, it, when we're, when we're um, looking for people to do the interviews, um, we really want people who have been politically involved and are fairly conversant with the issues and have uh, enough free time that they can be flexible about their time um, and you know, prepare for interviews because uh, they don't all happen on the same day. We try to get as many of them from a district on the same day, but you know, candidates are very busy and they may not be available. So, um, so anyway, the, the, so we interviewers um, are chosen at the discretion of the group uh, political chair or the chapter political chair. And then we need people to raise money for our political action committee or PAC. And um, this is a really, really important thing. If you are willing to have a house party or, or something to raise money for the PAC, um, it, it really helps us uh, with the candidates, if we can give them a small donation or if we can provide um, materials that will help them campaign. So that's what we use the money for and we'll go up more into that in, at, at a later stage. So that's it. I'm turning it over to you, Josh, for the rest of the time. Okay. Thanks, Betsy. <laughs> um, so, so we've made the endorsement, now what? Um, so first I'll just pause and say that process is pretty, um, uh, we take it very seriously. Um, and we believe that the Sierra Club endorsement carries, has a, uh, is an endorsement that has a lot of integrity because we're known as having a robust process. Um, people joke about how long our questionnaire is and how rigorous our interviews are. Um, and people deliberate a lot. Um, and I think that that's, we really look at every person's record, what they say, what they have on their website, how they voted. Um, 
so that when we make our endorsement and we share that endorsement with people, people take it seriously. That being said, just like a tree falling in the forest, if nobody knows about our endorsement, then it doesn't carry quite as much weight. So I'm gonna be talking about the campaigning aspect. So we've made our endorsement, now what? So belong, so, so begins the, in, the election phase. Very first thing we're gonna do is publicize the endorsement. Um, so for as many candidates as we can, um, we will do personalized endorsements, um, either by press release, definitely by social media, um, when possible by public event or letters to the editor. This is really just based on our capacity. We, we could do this at every local level as much as, as we would want to, but practically speaking, we do it for the big races, the governor's race, the attorney general's race, and maybe a few of the smaller races. And you think, go through a press release, who's really gonna care about who the Sierra Club endorses? Uh, well, it turns out the Washington Post cares. Um, when we did our endorsement of uh, uh, Chris Van Hollen last year, we got a great story in the Washington Post. Um, in the top left of your screen, you'll see um, that we put out a tweet announcing our endorsement of council member Bill Henry um, in Baltimore City's uh, Council District 4. Um, and you can't quite see it, it's really small, but you'll notice that he was very excited and he actually retweeted uh, the announcement of that endorsement. Um, it's one of my favorite and dreaded days of the year when I put out about 100 or so tweets highlighting all the different people that we've endorsed, but it's really notable to see how many of those people also share that information. So it's a win-win because they're thrilled that they've got our endorsement and we're excited that they care enough to tell everybody about it. Um, a lot of times the elected officials will ask us for a quote. So having somebody again, who's helped research and knows this person can provide a real authentic quote about why we've endorsed them. They will often put that out in a newsletter or on their website. Um, and what that does is that gives them the encouragement to push their environmental platform more forward, which is exactly what we want. Um, so the best thing we can do is turn out volunteers to support these candidates. Um, the best people that we select are usually the ones who aren't rolling in dough from you know, Exxon Mobil. So a lot of these people run grassroots operations and they need volunteers, especially in the primary, it's all about turnout, knocking on doors. So what we'll do is we'll get information about the volunteer opportunities and we'll put them out to our list saying we've endorsed um, Delegate Moon, we've endorsed Senator Pinsky, they need volunteers this Sunday um, for a phone bank. They need volunteers at their, you know, pizza party this Wednesday night. Um, and a lot of these folks are calling and talking to uh, constituents and really making a case on a door-to-door, -door, person by person basis. So we work really hard to turn people out. But the critical thing is when we turn them out, we don't want them going just as volunteers. We want them going as Sierra Club. And what that means is that we're multiplying our benefits. If you just volunteer for a candidate, just like if you just donate to the candidate, that's you know two hours of volunteer time or that's money in the pocket for them in a good way. But when we turn out people as Sierrans, they understand us as a powerful block, um, a block that's bringing volunteers, a block that's bringing money, and the block that will be there you know, through the next election. And that creates you know, organizational loyalty. So in the top left, uh, you'll actually see um, some staff and volunteers who went down and took a travel trip down to support um, Senator Tim Kaine in Virginia. Um, we actually will deploy some folks to other really vital races for uh, a couple weeks, even a month at times. And I imagine at some point, Betsy will probably organize a bus trip or two in 2018 to travel to a couple important races outside the state. Um, in the bottom right, you'll see the kickoff party that we organized for our endorsee uh, for governor in 2014, Heather Mazier. Betsy and I were talking about how to talk about that endorsement um, after she has given her incumbency speech. And 
what was really interesting is that when we are going to endorse somebody who may be seen as more of a long shot, uh, essentially it comes down to people making a really strong case. And while Heather Mazier was a long shot, she also had a solid fundraising plan and a field strategy and a huge amount of grassroots support. So um, that was one of those times where uh, we ended up going with uh, a candidate who may have been more of a long shot, but who had, you know, who was absolutely a viable candidate in the end, did not win, but uh, proved herself to be viable, you know, coming 1% short of somebody who spent $8 million more than she did. Now get out the vote, um, especially on the primary, but also in the general. Um, we're going to do a huge operation of turning people out. Uh, it used to be that we would say we were turning them out on election day, but as more and more Marylanders vote in early elections, um, we need to get people at the polling locations handing out what we've now dubbed our green ballot. Um, so we'll do that uh, as many polling locations as we can, um, as many locations as we can. Last year, we turned out about 50 people leading up to election day and then 30 people on election day. I'd like to see us deploy two to 300 people this year covering as many polling locations and early polling locations as possible. Um, if you need a pitch though, uh, Betsy, I think you had a story to share about how effective the green ballot has been the last couple elections. Yeah, um, I love the green ballot. Um, so I have worked the polls using our green ballot. And you know, as I assume that all of you people are uh, frequent voters and you have experienced the gauntlet that you, that you uh, run when you get to the polls and every candidate has literature that they want you to take. And um, people don't wanna take it because they've already made up their mind. But when I say um, Sierra Club endorsements, when I'm passing out my, uh, my list of Sierra Club endorsements, I, I've actually had people walk past me, assuming that I'm trying to give them something they don't want, and stop and turn around and say, I'll take that one. <laughs> <laughs> and we can have you know, an enormous uh, effect on especially in the primaries, because people do not really know um, who these people are and, they, and, and we give them valuable information. And in a lot of places in Maryland, people care deeply about the environment and wanna, you know, want to strengthen um, our position in the, in the legislature. Yep. I've even heard uh, not one, but two different stories of the candidates switching over to handing out the Sierra Club ballots with, yes. their, with their names highlighted because they thought it was going to be a more authentic way to advocate for themselves, showing our endorsement than just handing out their own literature. Yeah. Um, so the, the Maryland Sierra Club Political Action Committee, um, even though we are a 501c4 organization, uh, what we can do with our regular staff time is limited. Um, what we're technically allowed to do is inform our members, such as you, about who Sierra Club is endorsed. But any time we want to talk to the general public, and that even includes people on our email list whose membership is not in good standing or who have not joined a Sierra Club, whenever we do that, um, that's known as electioneering. And for that, we actually have to use money from our political action committee. We've had a political action committee for many years in Maryland. It's, it's essentially a, 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 you know, a monitored fund that you use for election work. Um, and special thanks to Mike Predel, our treasurer, and Charlie Garlow, our compliance officer, who makes sure that we're always being compliant with the law. Um, but what that means is what we do in support of general uh, campaigning for these candidates, public campaigning, we need to raise a separate pot of money. Um, and money doesn't win you elections, but yes, money does win you elections. Because when you have a good person, 
and you're in the Washington DC media market, the average state delegate and state senator is not going to get a front page story in the Washington Post. They look to organizations like ours to help spread the word about why they're the best candidate and to really make the case for them. So the Political Action Committee, first and foremost, supports our staff time and support in key races. Um, so that means that uh, last, in 2014, uh, we were working to hand out the literature all about, uh, about Brian Frosch for Attorney General. And when we were organizing a phone bank in our office that, that generated 5,000 calls for Brian Frosch and Heather Nazir, that staff time was funded by our political action committee. Um, the green ballots, when we hand those out um, at polling locations on election day or before election day, the printing and the time it takes to coordinate that comes from the political action committee. Um, additionally, with campaign finance rules being um, loosened in Maryland, the money is becoming more and more of a, uh, of, of a challenge and we're seeing um, you know, a lot of races being decided by candidates flooding uh, the media market. We're not looking to um, exacerbate that situation, but we are exploring making direct contributions to candidates in key races because it does help and they really, really notice it. Um, we're also exploring other ways to ramp up, including paid advertisements, print advertisements. Um, ultimately, our goal is to use the PAC to um, amplify our power, which is people power. We have 55,000 people on the Maryland Sierra Club email address list. So we have a huge number of people that we can mobilize, um, but it literally costs money every time we email them. So in order to make the most use of our constituency, uh, we're looking to raise $100,000 for the Maryland Political Action Committee uh, that we want to spend in 2018 because this issue and this election is so incredibly important. Uh, just a couple highlights to show. This was the mailing that we did in support of Heather in 2014. This mailing went to, I think, five or 6,000 homes of regular or likely voters. Um, oh, Betsy, unfortunately, I guess I did not have the picture of the palm card, but we made 10,000 palm cards in support of Brian Frosch, who it should be noted was running against uh, Delegate uh, John Cardin, who absolutely had the name recognition. Um, and that was a race in which the grassroots efforts to support Brian Frosch were really credited with having helped him with his uh, name recognition statewide. Um, oh, uh, so did we mention raising money for the PAC? Uh, if you're looking for information on making a donation or helping with fundraising for the PAC, it's all on here. Um, I don't think it's very legible, so I'm not going to spend too long on this slide. Um, and that wraps up our formal presentation. Um, I'm going to jump back and actually finish on a different slide, though, because we skipped it over in the very beginning. Um, we put together a list of highlights from the 2014 election that I really think just speaks to the scale of what we're doing. Um, our Maryland Sierra Club interviewed over 200 candidates in the election, um, ultimately making 159 endorsements. 80% um, of our candidates won. Um, I like that number. If 100% of our candidates won, I think we were just endorsing the winners. But it really does also speak to the fact that we we're campaigning for those people. We raised just under $20,000 for the Sierra Club pack. Um, which we used largely for promotional materials as well as staff time. I have mentioned the phone banking. It should be noted that we really that we called over 5,000 likely voters, which is in a race. In these primaries, they often get decided by 300, 200 votes. Um, so to call 5,000 likely voters is really a significant um, voting block that we have the ability to leverage. Um, so this is just a few of the highlights from the 2014 race. Our hope, our need, the necessity is to, is to scale that up significantly in the upcoming election, um, just given how critical of an election, how critical of a time this is. Um, and amazingly, seven minutes early, 
I'm going to figure out how to unmute everybody and we'll open it all up for questions. So just give me one second. Okay. So welcome everybody and welcome uh, Fido in the background. Um, we've got a half an hour. So if you have any questions or comments, let's go. If everyone could, before you ask your question, introduce yourself. Um, that would be great. Um, and other than that, uh, let's start it off. What, what, what can we talk about? I have a question. This is Lily. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Um, I was wondering, much of the presentation has been about how to help Sierra Club identify and promote the candidates that you have identified as the preferred candidates, basically through all the processes that you've talked about. Um, in Southern Maryland, which is mostly Republican or largely Republican, um, we're really hoping to find people or to identify and support candidates who are going to be new, first time. There have been a number who have spoken up and indicated their interest in uh, board of Com county commissioner level as well as state delegate level. So I guess I was sort of looking for and hoping to learn a little bit more about how can you help us help them mm -hmm. <laughs> if possible to articulate and develop their environmental positions. They may have their heart in the right place, but we need them to sound relatively sophisticated, you know, or at least you know, developed in their positions. And that's sort of earlier than where you started out this presentation. Yeah, candidate development. That's that, great. Um, does that make sense? Absolutely. Okay. Um, Betsy, do you want to take this or would you like me to? Uh, feel free, Josh. Um, so, this answer is going to be somewhat dissatisfying. Um, our operation is set up most, first and foremost, to interview and make the endorsements. We're, we're better set up for that. Um, so if when we endorse those candidates that you're talking about, there are significant tools that we have. Um, we have access to candidate trainings, our questionnaire, um, is deliberately written as a messaging document as well. So there's a lot of guidance. And we have, we have done everything from interviews to trainings to sharing message, internal messaging documents and fact sheets. So for those folks that we endorse, um, we would absolutely be able to come down, do a training and support those folks in how to best talk about the environment. Um, what we do to develop potential candidates to run is a lot trickier um, because essentially the person wants to know, like, you, you're with me, right? Like, you want me to run for office in a largely Republican area, um, and then you're telling me that three months from now I have to interview and you might not endorse me? That, that, that's a really challenging space. So I would say that Ultimately, the, the candidate recruitment is, is something that we should do more of. I think Sierra Club is trying to figure out how to balance that with its endorsement process, but we're not set up currently to do that type of stuff officially before we've made the endorsements. Um, I, however, can absolutely talk to you offline about lots of, uh, not lots, but several other organizations um, if they are Women Emerge Maryland is doing great trainings for um, aspiring female candidates. And there's several other groups which are doing really great early trainings, including environmental trainings as well. Okay, I, I will take you up on that offline. We are, uh, there are some Emerge things going on for Southern Maryland, but I'm interested in the other ones that you're talking about as well. Thank you. Well, I, I would also like to add that um, you know, a lot, particularly in Southern Maryland, you have very distinct uh, issues down in Southern Maryland and, and have done a great job 
last time um, electing people to the um, what do you call it down there? County board, you know? of, board of commissioners or no, 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 no. I think I think you're you may be we're talking about different boards of commissioners. The Calvert County Board of Commissioners is oh okay yeah so Calvert, that was in Calvert <laughs> County but anyway um, you do have uh, you, you do often have your own unique issues and I think a good a good thing to do might be to we have never done this but you might think about having a house party where you and where you invite candidates to talk just just um, socially about about environmental issues and ask and they can ask questions and you know um it's all very uh, informal and um so that's an idea okay thank yeah. you and uh just to check real quick um uh it's lily right it's lily Lily, sorry, Lily, are you, okay. and I apologize, are you plugged into the Southern Maryland group, the, the Sierra Club group? Uh, remotely, I'm not actually a member, but I am uh, plugged in to the people who are plugged in and, hmm. you know, and I'm aware. Yeah. Gotcha. So it would definitely be great to connect with them. Um, and there's a particular crew that ran a phenomenal effort to, um, get an environmental control of the Charles County Council. Okay. Uh, and I think that was at a time where that's the prospects of that were very bleak and they ran some, some incredible efforts and they have uh, been doing their own candidate recruitment as well. Um, and, you know, maybe it's a see no evil, hear no evil situation. Um, I don't know the details of it, but I would say that it has not violated anything that I'm aware of and they might be able to tell you how they were able to uh, maneuver that and what their lessons learned were. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, I will follow up on that. I I was looking at some of the uh, polls on the Charles County, the Southern Maryland, the three counties, Charles, St. Mary's, and Calvert mm -hmm. on climate change through the Yale program on climate change. Yep. And Calvert County did better than <laughs> either of Sierra Club or Calvert, so I think they're already dealing with a better environment, <laughs> yep. but I will definitely follow up uh, with them. Thank you. Welcome. And just for the record, if you're a member of any CR, uh, of the National CR Club, you're, you're a member of the CR Club group, chapter, national, whatever. Right. Thank you. So this is Cecilia, and my question is, do you have different legislative goals depending on which county or which, you know, part of the state that we're in? Um, so uh, if, if it's a, if it's a state legis piece of legislation, um, we, we have the same legislative goals across the state. Um, but the relative importance of that particular issue is why we, uh, the reason why we like to have people from the district do the interviews is that, for example, if you were interviewing somebody in um, uh, Anne Arundel County um, inside of a critical area, those folks may be much more interested in, in legislation related to the Forest Conservation Act than somebody else who was interested in how quickly we were gonna deploy offshore wind outside of Ocean City. Um, so we don't have different priorities officially, but we do absolutely encourage people to, um, to think about the issues that are most important to their district um, and to take that into account. Okay, thanks. Well, and certainly at the local level, there, there are different issues, so. I think to put it another way, part of what we're trying to do is to set people up for success. One mistake that a lot of organizations will make is that they'll make endorsements at such a far distance that they pick somebody who looks great to them, whether they're in the capital of the state or in the capital of the country based on a questionnaire. Um, 
you know, Betsy's been volunteering and working on elections for a long time. I have been working on elections for a long time. And we know that no matter how important the environment is, you're also still getting elected to serve that district. Um, and therefore, we want to give as much space to people to uh, our, who are volunteers who are doing the interviews and who are campaigning to find somebody who's also authentically passionate about serving that district. So we do have four you know, or six legislative priorities. We have our questionnaire, but you know, in the discussion, people will bring information in about uh, that person and their authentic interest in the county or the city or the district. Um, so we do think it is really important to make local considerations as well as, you know, our, our top issue considerations, because we're looking for people who are in it for the long haul and people who can win. Okay. Any other questions? Betsy, could you speak, this is Christopher Croft of Baltimore, would you be kind enough to speak to the uh, question of third party candidates and uh, in our position on just, just for clarity for everyone? Um, okay, so where, where you're, are you speaking about the Green Party? Are you, yes, uh, I, and specifically, yeah. Green party? Yeah, um, we're, we're often urged to um, look at candidates from the Green Party and um, many of the candidates from the Green Party are, um, you know, excellent on our issues. Um, un unfortunately, um, we live in a country where there are two major parties and it's very unusual for a um, a person from a third party to win. And so this may, I mean, I think that they're much more likely to win in a very local election where they can, they can, um, you know, go door to door. They don't need a lot of money. Uh, they can introduce themselves to, um, to the public uh, for, less effort and less money um, and they could get a start at a local level but I I really think that it is um, very difficult for somebody from third party to win a higher level election and one of our one of the things that that we need to assess is a candidate's um, prospect of winning, and that, and we have to look at all the things. So, uh, and one of them is going to be: Are they one of, in, you know, running in one of the two major parties? Um, because in Mar well, I mean, they're just much more likely to win if they are. You notice that uh, Bernie Sanders became a Democrat when he ran for president. So. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason for that. Betsy, from a from a policy standpoint, just to clarify, from us from a policy standpoint, we will absolutely consider third party candidates. Uh, in, I, in we have endorsed we we have in a couple of instances endorsed a Green Party candidate. As a matter of fact, Christopher in the Baltimore City elections. Um, recently endorsed a Green Party candidate, but in neither case did they win. But they were, right. but they were, they were candidates who, who had money, who had a plan, and, you know, the other candidates were not, you no, know, they weren't very good, so it didn't, you know, that was okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for clarifying that, Betsy. Uh, the other question uh, I think is worth discussing briefly is the uh, a um, incumbent and challenging an incumbent and so forth. And that's that's uh, very important as well. 
for instance, the uh, we'd be very careful about challenging an incumbent depending on the circumstances. I mean, if you elaborate on that a little bit, it might be helpful as well. Okay, well, um, we look at all of our incumbents before we, uh, before we start this process to see if there are, are incumbents who have helped us um, in our, you know, win on our issues. And if they have, they most likely will be endorsed. And even if a, even if a candidate comes along who's a much better talker, um, better on some, maybe be even better on some of our, on, on a couple of our issues, uh, we still want to reward people who are in office who help us. So, um, because we have had, we have had a situation where somebody talks a good game, well, look at, look at Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Donald Trump, as a candidate, said all kinds of things that he is now acting against. So, I mean, that's just a good example of somebody who, who can, you know, bring down the rafters for, <laughs> for some issue while they're running as a candidate without a record, and then they turn around and they do something else. So incumbency is very important because we got people who have actually helped us and done stuff. So we value that. I'd like to follow up on that. This is Lily, but um, let other people ask some questions first. But I do have a follow up question to that. Okay, go ahead. Should I go ahead? Okay, I don't want to ask too many questions. Um, I understand what you're saying, but that to me is a little bit of an issue of concern. Um, coming from Calvert County, we have been fighting for three years the Dominion Co Point LNG facility. And I don't know, I don't know exactly who you might have endorsed, but I know that Ben Cardin is considered to be a climate champion. Barbara Mikulski was considered to be a climate champion. Uh, Steny Hoyer is considered to be a great friend on all these things. So my real concern is that they all shut us down. They would not listen to us. They would not give us opportunities to meet with them. They either, in the case of Hoyer and Cardin, wholeheartedly endorsed it, the facility, or in the case of Mikulski, stayed completely silent, even though it was in complete, by staying silent, it was in contradiction to everything she'd done for the Sparrows Point issue. So I'm a little concerned about what you're calling, I guess, the incumbency rule, and how I, as somebody who is definitely interested in environmental issues, and I'm not, I don't think, a one party or one issue person, and the people, I know many people who are concerned about this, we're also not one party, but we see the incumbents of have, as having shut us down. And I'm a little, so I guess I'm looking for more clarification, if it's possible, yep. on your incumbency support uh, rule. Betsy, do you mind if I jump in on this? Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Josh. Um, uh, so thank you. That, that's a great question. And I think you, your example really illustrates the rule. Um, what we're talking about is if we ask somebody to do to vote for five things and they vote for all five of those things and they have a hundred percent voting record try not to turn around and then endorse somebody else. um so in the example that you gave uh it's challenging because it's right at the margin um i can't disclose the internal parts of our um endorsement process but i can tell you that uh, Betsy and myself and several other people um, made a very strong point in expressing frustration with the positions of several people uh, on the Cove Point issue when making our last round of endorsements. At that particular point, it did not lead to changing the endorsement, but I can tell you it definitely did not go unmentioned. So the examples you're bringing up, they, they weren't votes and they were outside the purview of the candidates, which makes it a bit challenging for us to like, it's hard to weigh public statements versus votes. 
Um, but those are exactly the types of things that do get taken into consideration. So we're not just blindly endorsing incumbents because they're incumbents. What we're doing is making sure that we're measuring somebody against the things we've told them that we cared about. So really what this is about is it's trying to prevent a situation of having an incumbent, asking them to do something, having them do everything we've asked, and then turning around because somebody else did something else and said they were going to, a, a, a new, um, a, a, I'm a new candidate talked a big game. Um, in the case you're talking about, we, the Sierra Club, as well as you, had a position on the issue. And those incumbents who are not in line with that, that was a big part of our endorsement conversations and our endorsement process. That was not a, that was not a shoe in and I, I can't give you more details than that, except to say, as an example, I think you're highlighting exactly when the incumbency rule is not applied blindly and when those people had to, uh, when those deliberations were um, robust. Thank you. So this is Cecilia again. Um, did you endorse Hogan? No. <laughs> Just making sure. <laughs> Just making sure. And, and we will not endorse him. Good. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Hi, this is uh, Tim Latimer from Howard County. Could I pose a question, please? Go ahead, Tim. Um, I just wondered if um, you all would accept uh, volunteers who are not necessarily members of uh, the Sierra Club. I've been working uh, the last few months with the uh, Howard County chapter of uh, Indivisible. And we have a number of people who are very concerned about environmental issues. We have an environmental action team, uh, some of whom are Sierra Club members and some of whom are not. But uh, we're thinking about, you know, how we keep our uh, folks engaged and, and productive in, you know, winning so yeah just wanted to make sure that if uh, some folks may or may not be inclined to join the sierra club but they may be still willing to um, step up and do some of these volunteer activities whether it's phone banking or some of the other sorts of things so i just wanted to make sure if there was any kind of a prerequisite uh, for folks to, to join the club before they could engage in that kind of stuff just would be good yeah. to know before we ask them to do so Tim, it, I, 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 I am so excited about the prospects of the power that has been built with the in, indivisible groups and the Women's March and Together We Will. Um, and I think there, uh, uh, one of our goals is to create volunteer opportunities for people to get behind environmental candidates and to even brand those in a way that is less branded as Sierra Club, only as much as it helps but in a way that really just gives people a chance to rally for strong environmental candidates. Um, however, there are several volunteer activities that only Sierra Club members can do. And, and uh, you know, doing, doing the interviews um, and, and engaging in the candidate and the endorsement conversations is limited to uh, Sierra Club members. The other people can weigh in as, you know, advisors or something like that, but those, th those conversations are otherwise limited to members. But the volunteerism in support of those candidates is something that we that you know come one come all that would absolutely love to partner and have the support of members and non-members. Uh, that's really terrific to hear. We really uh, appreciate that. And uh, if I could just put in a quick plug on uh, June the third, we're actually hosting a town hall in Howard County yep. uh, focused on environmental issues at three o'clock that afternoon. It's a Saturday at the Owen Brown Interfaith Center in Columbia. Um, we'll have Attorney General uh, Brian Frosch, um, uh, State Senator uh, Guy Gazzani, who I'm sure Sierra Clubbers uh, may know well, um, and others there. So, um, you know, we are working um, as, a, as a chapter of Indivisible to try to bring some greater focus to these issues. Uh, and the thrust of it is on the impact of Trump's uh, actions and particularly his budget cuts uh, on the environment here in Maryland and the kind of impact it would have. So. We certainly welcome uh, folks, uh, you know, and, and look forward to opportunities to collaborate with you all. Wonderful, yeah, and we've got that up on our website, and we we've we've put out some word on it. Um, and Guy Gazzoni, it should be noted, uh, 
um, used to work for the Maryland Sierra Club many years ago. Exactly. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Do we have other questions? So if we don't have any other questions and we still have a few minutes, I would like to just put in a plug for something for an idea that I have been floating uh, since the uh, climate march. And that is that um, we're all environmentalists and we all care deeply about uh, climate change. And what I've noticed is that climate change is considered an environmental issue. And if you look at the issues that people vote on, the environment is way down the list. And I think that we need to work very hard to make sure that people consider climate change a much bigger deal than, it, I, and I hate to say this, just an environmental issue. It is so much bigger than that. And it needs to be its own issue on the list of issues people vote on. And we need to, we need to make sure that people understand what is going to happen if climate change continues I mean, if carbon continues to be pouring out of our smokestacks. And tailpipes. Mm -hmm. uh, anywhere. We, I mean, we, we are killing ourselves and the earth. If I could just jump in again, this is Tim. Uh, totally agree and, and really, uh, you know, hope that we could... Uh, focused on not only the environmental dimension, but the economic opportunities that are presented by tackling climate change and the security challenges that climate change yes. poses. I mean, those are huge issues that I think people are not connecting the dots about things they worry about. ISIS, very few people know about the connections between climate change and what's happening in the Middle East. And we talk about immigration and concerns about building a wall. Very few people are talking about the drought in Central America and the kinds of impacts that that may be having on people and forcing them to leave their home countries look for yes. better opportunities. I'd like to add to that. Again, this is Lily. Um, I'm a realtor. People uh, tend to think of this, like you say, either as a, uh, an environmental issue or uh, I think actually, Tim, you're right, people don't think of it as much in terms of security. But it's also more of a day-to-day -day thing. And um, as a realtor who works, you know, in the Bay Area, it comes down to your homes. It comes down to economy and jobs and all that. So I agree that the more that we can move that away from the environmental tag, um, the better, really. Anyway, that's all. Thanks. This is Josh. Uh, I'm just going to build off that and say, I'm, as, we, as we hit the end of this presentation, um, this is the first webinar that I've done of this type. I will admit that I'm very excited about the, the, the slides that Betsy and I put together, um, but no presentation like this can replace the feeling of excitement of having a candidate that really speaks to you. You know, when I talk about Brian Frosch, I think about him at the debates. I think about him in his interview and the conversations we had. I think about, um, you know, the inspiration of, of, the, of these individual people. Um, and uh, Lily, I think about um, the conversations that we have with these candidates where they ask us about issues. And as they learn how to express their passions in the most compelling way. In other words, they learn how to make the environment um, or climate change um, a winning political issue. And I just wanted to say that that's really hard to capture in slides. It's hard to explain. But um, I hope that um, all of you will stay involved and get to be at the point of being one or one of a few Sierra Club contacts for, for a candidate. Uh, because it allows you to play the role of, of helping them shape their environmental platform 
um, not just on the issues, but as Tim was saying, also how they talk about the issues. Um, because a lot of them are so busy knocking on doors, they don't have time to fine tune their message for 20 or 30 different issues. Um, and that's one of the roles that we can play. It's not just identifying the good candidates, but also helping them to construct the best message. So for the people that we endorse, we also will work with them on those elements. Um, and we have such huge, huge fights ahead of us on climate change, transportation, um, clean energy, protecting the Bay, um, that we need people who both will be comfortable publicly committing to huge ambitious goals, but also selling those in ways that really appeal to a large enough section of the population that we can prove that it's possible to get elected as a hardcore pro environment candidate. Um, and that's really what we're going to need to, we're going to need to build a, a cadre of incredibly unapologetic but compelling pro-environment candidates this election. Any other questions? Okay. So what's going to happen next is in the next two days, I'm going to send everybody a follow-up email um, with uh, instructions on how to um, share information on what, if any, pieces of this you're most interested in participating in. Um, for folks who are local, which is everybody, we're also going to try to connect you to the political chairs of your local groups who are also looking for um, folks uh, to help with interviews or connect locally. Um, the next two to three months are going to be the interview candidate research process. If you're a person who is really interested in knocking on doors, um, take some time to gather up your energy, um, stretch out your, your walking shoes, because that, that portion of it is not going to start for a little while, but we will start doing some house parties, some fundraisers, and some events to build our environmental war chest. So um, look for an email in the next couple of days, and I would encourage everyone to think about what types of work most excite you, um, and we'll do our best to try to plug you into what we have going on. Um, and to everybody who, who asks some good, hard questions too, this is a process that is that is volunteer run. Uh, just for what it's worth, um, I don't I don't vote in the uh, endorsements. It's no paid staff vote on the endorsements. It's purely the elected volunteers. It's a process that's evolved and it's a process that's shaped by the volunteers. So if any of this you know rubbed you the wrong way, if you have questions, engage in the process. It's it's a democratically run organization and it's shaped by our volunteers. So. Um, whether this everything you wanted or mostly everything that wanted, I would encourage you all to get involved and shape this political program um, into what you think it should be. Betsy, do you have any uh, closing comments? No, I just, well, I would just like to thank everybody for coming and, and uh, please get involved if you um, want to help make American uh, Maryland environmentally strong. <laughs> Sorry, I, I really thought you were going to say to make Maryland great again. Um, yeah. <laughs> hey, Maryland's already great. <laughs> All right, and if you have feedback on the slideshow, this was our this was our very first run. So feedback, um, feedback, and welcome and encouraged. Not right now, but by email or something. All right. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.